Three, three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Silly Persist. My name is Tamara Lash, and I'm the I Woman of Color graduate assistant, and I use she and her pronouns. And my name is Sienna Kasky, and I use she and her pronouns, and I am the I Woman of Color Initiative Leadership Liaison. And so on this episode, we're going to be talking about multiraciality here at Oregon State, and we have two phenomenal people here with you if you want to introduce yourselves. I am Brianna Keller Robbins, I use she, her pronouns. I'm Sophia Baum, I use she, her pronouns. And like always, we're going to acknowledge the land that we are on and know that every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. What we now call Corvallis, Oregon, is located within the traditional homelands of the Marys River or Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya. Today, living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. We pay respects to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. Awesome. Thank you, Sienna, for reading that. So as Sienna said, today we're going to be chatting about multiraciality. Um, and before we sat down at this table and like turned on the cameras, we were trying to think of where do we begin? Mm -hmm. Because multiraciality is such a massive topic. The experiences that we have are so different. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just hard to dial down. Um, the opening question that we decided to start with is kind of just walk us through your experiences as a multiracial individual here at Oregon State University. Whoever feels moved to start. Me? <laughs> okay. Um, so I came to Oregon State from Southwest Portland. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a very white high school, uh, so that's a little bit of background info. Um, my first experience was with EOP though, so I came mm -hmm. here a week early. Um, EOP's Educational Opportunities Program, bridge program for first generation students with other marginalized identities. Um, and so I, I had a very first brown week. Like every other student was brown and everyone came from some sort of struggling background. Um, so I found a lot of camaraderie there. And then as soon as everyone moved into my dorm, mm -hmm. uh, can I name my dorm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As soon as everyone moved into Polling Hall, uh, it was a lot more of a wider community. Um, and that was very, shocking just because the first week was so affirming mm -hmm. um, and so then polling hall was the college of business uh, living learning uh, community um, so it was a very competitive area and I eventually left the college of business just because I could not sur I couldn't survive in a place where it was all about working together but competing together mm -hmm. um, and so Throughout my time at OSU, I've had a lot of instances where my race has just been like the center of attention, um, whether it's been in classrooms or whether it's been like searching for love. Um, it's I've always been like kind of fetishized or uh, people always ask like, what are you? Before mm -hmm. they want to actually talk about hobbies and like get to know each other. Um, and I hate being asked like, what are you? Mm -hmm. um, I've had some uncomfortable instances in CRCs before, um, not fitting the mold of what a black person should be or mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to look like, act like. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I know I'll think of other things though. Yeah. Um, so the community that I come from is a very small rural community. Um, race was never really talked about. Uh, there was a small handful of Latinos in my in my high school, and then I was also I mixed, so I'm Mexican and Jewish, and I was also like the only Jew in my high school. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an interesting balance, and so like like these things were not talked about at all. Like nobody talks about them, um, and so when I came here, actually like my like week zero fall term freshman year, I actually met Charlie Martinez. She was like tabling mm -hmm. for the um, for multiracial beavers, and I was like, 
what? Like, you all actually talked about this? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. no, yeah. nobody talked about, talked about it. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I, like, fit in. I finally can, like, see myself represented. I can talk to other people who have similar experiences, mm -hmm. e even if we grew up in different contexts, have, have um, similar themes that kind of uh, that come through with how we walk in the world. Um, but I, that was the first time um, that I really delved into a community um, that I felt like I belonged to, mm. and the first time that I really felt that. I, I think that, and this is not to be like, oh, like my childhood was not good. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is like, I, I never felt fully accepted where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a very, very big deal for me, and still is a very, very big mm -hmm. deal for me. And I've only ever been able to, um, so far, uh, uh, hold on to that or keep that in with with multiracial beavers what I had with that community and also with 3D which is a um, like multicultural uh, woman of color performance group dance mm -hmm. group mm -hmm. yeah I think OSU complicated my <laughs> racial <laughs> identity mm. I I knew I always had questions of belonging and where my community was um, before I came here but when I got here I just like escalated in complications because I was in spaces where I didn't know if I could fully be in them mm -hmm. or if I shouldn't be in them. Should I be talking to this person? Should I not? How am I taking up space? Where is my privilege? Like all these questions are like going off like alarms in my head. Mm -hmm. And so the easiest thing for me was just to avoid it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> avoid it. Yeah. Like I'm just nope, not going to go there. Yeah. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing until I found the Women and Gender Center, mm -hmm. which was like I felt the only place where I could be accepted fully for like mm -hmm. every aspect of my identity. Um, and something that we talked about earlier was how that space was a very white space. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like up until a few years ago, I think maybe when you were there, Mm -hmm. um, we could talk a little more about I know. that. I don't know. Like, fingers crossed. Like me and Issa did something. I oh, don't know. Definitely. But like. Yeah, it's tricky, and I, like, really resonate with what you said about, like, the cultural resource centers and trying to find a space, and it's difficult mm -hmm. when all of the centers that we have on this campus are very monoracial, mm -hmm. and, like, for me, as I came into Oregon State, I, like, grew up in a military family, and we moved around, and we were always by POC, but, like, never had a conversation around, like, multiraciality or mm -hmm. what that meant and how I fit into it. But I always was trying to like embrace my blackness in certain ways that I didn't really know how. And I was just like becoming the stereotype that I thought the world wanted me to be. Oof. And yeah. so yeah. then like came here to Oregon State and wanted to work at the cultural resource centers and like hopped into different centers and was trying to test out the waters and like just and didn't feel right mm -hmm. for me too until I stepped foot in the WGC and recognized that like because in some ways it's not tied to race. Mm -hmm. Like I have the ability to explore myself, mm -hmm. um, both in like my gender and my sexuality and mm -hmm. like my race and ethnicity mm -hmm. in ways that I've never been given the space to do before. Um, that was really nice. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until like last year that I actually got to work really closely with Charlene because shout out to her mm -hmm. and go to multiracial Aikido and like find a multiracial community. Cause like, never before did I have that or even know that it like slightly existed here mm -hmm. and so sitting in space at that table with like multiracial like professional yeah. staff yeah. was yeah. weird yeah <laughs> and I was like felt so seen and like holy shit like I can be them mm -hmm. yeah like that's weird yeah because we don't really have that or people don't talk about necessarily like multiracial models or like yeah. multiracial like people doing jobs or like teachers yeah, or whatever like it's like yeah it's like the first black president but like what about like the first whatever like I don't know multiracial teacher yeah oh yeah that's a really good point where is that conversation mm -hmm. being had mm -hmm. yeah. one thing I noticed that all of us have brought up is like whether we can bring not that we are half of anything, but like whether we can bring our other identity into a certain space, mm -hmm. especially yeah. here at OSU. Yeah. I've had, like every time I walk into a building, a classroom, I'm like, can I bring my blackness with me? Mm -hmm. Can I bring my whiteness with me? Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that the BCC, 
I can't bring my whiteness. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, in like in my political science classes, I can't bring my blackness. Mm -hmm. And there's like, and I don't know exactly what I'm saying by that, but there's like, I can't bring certain aspects mm -hmm. of my identity into certain spaces. Otherwise, I'm leaving myself way too vulnerable, and yeah. mm -hmm. that's not. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I resonate with that, and that's hard too because I feel like for me at least, as I leave parts of me out of space, then I feel like I'm leaving parts of my parents or like parts yeah, of my sister yeah, or my yeah. grandma or my grandpa or like mm -hmm. whoever out of the space too, knowing so much that these were the people that like made me yeah. who I am today. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's so much to wrestle with. Yeah. Because these are like your people. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like ashamed, but not ashamed, but like feel like I can't bring my people mm -hmm. yeah. into space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've actually, I had a conversation with my mom about that, about mm -hmm. bringing, like, feeling like I'm canceling her out. My mom is um, white, and so I remember growing up in high school, I had a really, really hard time with my multiraciality because of my job. So I was a hostess at a restaurant, it was an Italian restaurant, and so people either thought I was the Italian granddaughter of the owners, or I... I, there's so many questions from like older white men that were so, so intrigued by who I was. And mm -hmm. I remember I would come home crying because I would, I'd be getting interrogated at work about my identities. And I was like, mom, I don't know why they don't see me. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why do they have to ask me? They're not going to go ask my white coworker what they are. And so, and she, I remember like we had a conversation. I was like, but I want to embrace both sides without canceling dad or you. Mm -hmm. And she was like, Sienna you'll never be able to cancel me out. And I was like, oh, oh shit. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Okay. And so like, when my mom, when I had that conversation with my mom and I got that reassurance from her, it felt like I was, I finally had the ability to like explore my Mexican side more mm. because I knew that my mom, like we had a conversation and dialogue over, like you can't cancel me out. Like, mm -hmm. I, you get to explore this because that is you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so like having that reassurance for her really helped me mm -hmm. navigate OSU a little bit better when I got mm -hmm. here. Yeah. That's interesting how you say, um, like almost like permission. Like yeah. Permission. yeah, it was like permission. Yeah, yeah. To, to explore wh mm -hmm. whatever that is. I feel like, I don't know if y'all have been through this. This is just, uh, I'm just speaking for myself, but I feel like in different points of my life, I've accepted certain, I not accepted, I've, uh, had to present myself or felt like I had to present myself in specific ways. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, yo, like I'm, I'm learning a lot about like um, Jewish history and oppression mm -hmm. and um, genocide and all of these things. And so like I'm down, I'm down with like being Jewish or whatever. <laughs> and then like I'm learning a lot about like what it means to be um, Latina and what it means to like be, um, a lot of my family's Tex-Mex, so mm. there's also bumps that mm -hmm. come up with that, of like, you're not really Mexican, mm. you're really whitewashed, our dialect is different, mm. our, our um, food is different, um, pretty much like everything is different, so so I have a lot of, yeah. lot of that too, yeah. of like the quantifying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. piece, and then um, also like, oh, I, I feel that, I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. learning Spanish mm -hmm. is not, um, something that I don't want to pursue, it's that I feel that I'm holding myself back. Mm. Because, mm -hmm. of, because, I'm con <laughs> because I'm constantly, right, being like, I'm not enough, but people mm -hmm. always think that I'm enough, mm -hmm. and like, I, I'm balancing all these expectations, and yeah. it's something that I want to do, but I, but I like, I've There's sat in spend classes and be like, mm. Oh. Mm. oh, I remember in high school, I had a white boy ask me, why are you in this class? You're Mexican. Yeah. Mm. And ever since then, I can still remember his name, I can picture him, saying it to me and ever since then I shut down yeah and so the language was so hard for me because yeah. I was like like why am I getting asked why am I always getting asked why I'm here yeah. where are you what are you and yeah I'm just like it's just finally like, I shut down in high school and mm -hmm. I'm like sometimes I even shut down here because I'm just like yeah. Ugh, I don't want to explain anything to you people yeah. don't owe you that at all yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. people that like our skin color define where we should be in a space yeah. and that mm -hmm. is the biggest problem with I, I personally think with being my multiracial, just because our skin color is a mix mm -hmm. of two different races, mm -hmm. um, and it dictates where we can be when we can like transgress both of those mm -hmm. all different kinds of communities. Yet it dictates if we can exist in those communities. Yeah. Yeah. It's really problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that I hear coming up a lot is like 
this idea of permission and even like permission without naming that we're asking for permission Mm -hmm. from people outside of us and I am wondering like what does it look like or what would it look like if we gave ourselves permission without waiting for someone else to give it to us Mm -hmm. like walked into space and was like I'm gonna like be all of who I am in this space without you saying like oh yeah you can do that what would that look like I think I've tried that before I think I I've personally tried it before. I don't know if anyone else has, Mm -hmm. but when I have tried it, I'm immediately shut down. Mm -hmm. And like, that's where I was explaining previously that when I go into a CRC and I'm told I can't exist as a certain Mm -hmm. being, Mm -hmm. that's when I shut down. Mm -hmm. And then I don't think I have permission any longer. Like Mm -hmm. when I, like, yeah. Does that, Mm -hmm. should I be more specific? No, that makes sense. (laughs) So I think if I've, I've, I've given myself permission in spaces and then when I receive negative feedback, that's when I like no longer, I'm just like, can I exist in this space? Like that's when I feel I need permission mm. to do, mm-hmm. to exist. Mm. I've been thinking about that a lot and I used to think that I gave myself permission a lot until I realized that I am not going to the centro because there's so many things blocking me from it. And mm. so I'm interested to try it, and if, I don't know, but there is something like, I just don't want to go to the Four Seas, even though I love that space. It's a beautiful space. The people there are really cool, but it's more of like my mind is like, don't go there. Why would you go there? You're not, yeah. you're not gonna, it's not your community. Yeah. Mm. You're not fully that, and then, yeah. so like I get down on myself a lot, but I'm also like, Sienna, you're the woman of color leadership liaison. <laughs> you're <just> like, <laughs> you, well, how can you get more brown than that? <laughs> like, yeah. um, and so I think having this position has allowed me to kind of define myself in a different way that isn't attached to like two different countries. Because mm. that's the way that I see my identity. It's like separated by an, in- an invisible border. Mm. Mm. Which has a different conversation, but yeah. <laughs> and then all borders are invisible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just thinking about that. Yeah. Mm. 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 That's tricky. That's really difficult. Do you have any thoughts, Sophia? Yeah, I I do. Can you repeat the last section yeah. that you just said? Well, I was kind of saying how, um, like, being the women of color leadership liaison. Yeah. Uh, allows me to feel more brown yeah I think Mm. yeah Um, even though I've never been read as white and so I always knew I was brown but I always say brown I don't say Mexican like that's something that I've like that's something that I've noticed too like I'm I know I'm Latina I've embraced that but I always say I'm brown. Yeah. Mm. Which I like kind of avoiding. I'm the, avoiding yeah. the other conversation <laughs> yeah. that Sienna needs to have with Sienna. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I feel that. Yeah. That's really, that's really, really interesting that you say that too, because it almost seems like, right, the, like using the, the label or the term or identifying as like brown mm. or woman of color, for me, and I don't know if it's for you all, it's more comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I don't have to explain. Mm-hmm. 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 I don't have to name it. I don't have yeah. to name it. I don't have to oh, prove myself. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Biracial is too ambiguous for everyone on this campus. Mm-hmm. And so as soon as I say biracial, they're like, with what? Yeah. What are you yeah. still? And I'm yeah. like, uh, biracial. Yeah. Biracial. And that's yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. Or I, I always catch myself saying, I'll be, I, I see it in classrooms a lot, black and brown bodies, but I'll just be talking about myself. But then mm-hmm. I'll instantly say black and brown, just because I get so uncomfortable naming mm-hmm. the black. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I always do it. Um, it's just like I, there's no need to be uncomfortable naming it. I don't know why though. Mm-hmm. I think something that I want to talk in more depth with is about the fetishization of mixed people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure we've all had experiences with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know who wants to start. Or if I can share a story that recently happened. Um, I uh, just quit a job because mm. constantly was getting comments from men, mm. uh, typically white men, yeah. uh, older white men, uh, just about my body, about my looks, and mm. I'm, I have to be nice, I'm at work. Uh, I worked at a place that had like 10 plus cameras everywhere, mm. so if I was rude, it was seen. Um, and recently someone said, are you mixed? And I was behind the counter, just minding my business, and I said, yes. He goes, oh, with what? And I just stood up and I said, why does it matter? 
-hmm. and there's customers in a line behind them, there's my coworkers over mm -hmm. there. And like that was the first time I've ever not justified or said what my race was immediately. Mm -hmm. And I just stood up and I was like, why does it matter? And he was like, him and his friends were just like, well, I'm mixed too. And I was like, cool, neat. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm black and Mexican. And I was like, okay, not awesome. I was like, I, I have a few black and Mexican friends. And then that was the end of our conversation. And that was the first time I've ever not justified myself and not had to explain myself. And that was the first time someone has asked me that question and not said the words, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful, or you're pretty for a black girl mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, and I felt so powerful that I like went in the back and I did like a happy dance because I was just like, yes, like I got it. Like that was the first right time that I haven't had to be like, I'm black and white. Oh, my dad's black. Yeah, my mom's white. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, like stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And so, yeah, just wanted to share that out there. Hope I empower you all yeah. to not yeah. justify your race uh, ever yeah. again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of like the fetishization has come from like more like sexual encounters too, yeah. mm -hmm. which has like forced me to just disregard men mm -hmm. at the current moment, mm -hmm. and other genders too. Like honestly, like I, I but I've received majority of the fetishization from men, mm -hmm. and it's I've been it's just the weirdest things that come out of people's mouths sometimes, and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, you don't like me because of Sienna Rose Caskey. It's you don't you like me because. I'm this Latina that's some kind of sexual being mm -hmm. in your head that you mm -hmm. see in the media. Mm -hmm. And that's just like the most frustrating thing for me. And especially when there's songs like, oh like Camila Cabello, when she came out with that Senorita song, mm -hmm. I was so pissed off because I've had people, I've had white men call me oh, hey, senorita, like, oh, we want to come, like, it just say the grossest shit to me. And so when she came out, and I was like, you're allowing this white boy to call you that too? Like, and you're okay with it? And, like, that's, like, her life, not mine. I don't think we'll ever talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? But it's, like, <laughs> when that came out, I was just like, no, don't, I don't want white boys mm -hmm. to think that this mm -hmm. is okay. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not okay. Like, don't call me that. Mm -hmm. I think it's just the media really enforces the way that some men interact with me. Mm -hmm. And it's really frustrating and yep. mm -hmm. hits a lot of different emotional aspects to me that I'm dealing with currently. And so it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of y'all have yeah. weird stuff like that. No, I feel like the majority of the weird, like gross fetishization stuff that I've seen and experienced have been like via Tinder. Oh, and so like, T God, I no longer have that or need that in my life because holy, holy. shit. Yes. People like feel really empowered to say some gross ass mm -hmm. stuff yeah. when they are mm -hmm. behind a computer mm -hmm. or like phone and mm, mm -hmm. like that's where weird stuff comes. And I feel like in fraternity basements yep. mm -hmm. is where some weird stuff goes down to. And it's like tricky to navigate as well as you like think about your safety, yeah. especially yeah. like if you're out like at a bar or if you're at a party like that and someone comes up to you and is like, ooh, man. Yeah. Like <laughs> little cocoa, no. chocolate drop, precious yeah. cast, yeah. like, caramel this. Please uh -huh. stop. Uh -huh. Like I didn't ask for that <laughs> yeah. at all. I didn't <laughs> I just we would know. never go up to a white person and be like, you beautiful snow, oh. <laughs> pure, pure vanilla. Oh. So you would never do that. You would never you do would that. Never so why do you do it to my brown body? Like, yeah. what? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of history of why they act. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I say why, but we, I know, we, we know, know why. why. But do, do other people know? I don't know. Like, mm. it's the history of like, specifically black women seen as disposable and uh, yeah. able mm -hmm. to be used for, like, reproductive uses yeah. in a good and so it from slavery it just kind of like reshapes and reforms mm -hmm. with like the media and how people interact and it's this cycle mm -hmm. that I don't know when it's going to stop yeah and like the missing and murdered indigenous women like that mm -hmm. is an epidemic of violence against indigenous femmes mm -hmm. and so it's like the little comments add up 
Yeah, like you can see the connection. Like we're getting killed mm -hmm. by these comments and the way that we react to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I even think about the ways like and this like taboo I think to talk about, but porn sites mm. will like name mm. categories of people like I have mixed chicks doing whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like. <laughs> Okay, yep. but like th again, that is giving people like people feel like they can go out and then say this mm -hmm. to folks like, mm -hmm. oh, I saw this on TV, I saw this on my Pornhub, like whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is okay, and I can act to you in this way, and I can act violent yeah. with you in this way because like the media has told me that it's okay mm -hmm. over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just porn that I see whiteness being defaulted to but like just in general just like white is always the default it's always the first thing you kind of see mm -hmm. and then you have to specifically search natural black brown any mm -hmm. sort of ethnic or textured you have to put those words in front of what you're looking for mm -hmm. in order to find something that relates to uh, black and brown bodies mm -hmm. um, and I yeah that you what you said made me think of that it's just mm -hmm. like the default is always whiteness and so mm -hmm. you never like fed it why why fetishize whiteness mm -hmm. you know it's the default it's the normal so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that's a good way to put it it is I say normal very like yeah there is no normal. normal okay yeah, yeah. yeah. let me say yeah. normal. No. every time I say normal I usually do mm -hmm. air quotes but that's mm -hmm. like a really good way to put it and name it because why would you fetishize what's normal mm -hmm. yeah or like what society deemed normal or dominant or whatever yeah mm -hmm. I think it's interesting when it ties into relationships too, because I've I've always been seen as like the sex, per like the sex symbol, but never the relationship type of deal too. And mm. so it's like, yeah, and it's even like men of color too. If we're looking at it in a heterosexual way, like it's mm -hmm. oh, I don't actually want you. I'd rather go with a white girl, mm. but like we can hook up, and you're just like what? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, okay, <laughs> whatever, bye. <laughs> But it's, it's so interesting navigating multiraciality because it impacts everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, just like race. Race impacts everything. But, I mean, oof. I'm like, I'm nervous to, if I do have kids, if I have a daughter, like, I'm nervous mm -hmm. of, like, her experiences. And I don't know mm -hmm. what the future's going to be like. And like, if I'm nervous just right now talking about these things, like, what's going to be like in the future? Mm -hmm. I hope it's better. I have a question for you all. Do you notice the fetishization from white men is different from the fetishization from brown men towards our bodies? Mm. I could give an example. Because like for white men, I'm usually being told I'm exotic or pretty mm. for a black girl and stuff like that. But when it comes from brown men, it's I'm told I'm light skin or I get mm. like the, mm -hmm. I'm called caramel or something mm -hmm. like that yeah. or like stuff like that. And yeah. like I think the fetishization is very different from my different identities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely agree because there's um, almost like like uh, expectations mm -hmm. or like, oh, you're probably like a, a master or like a genius or mm -hmm. you know all these things mm -hmm. because you're a part of this community, um, specifically from from white white men, white folks, and um, so they hold you as like a whole representative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too. Mm -hmm. In addition, in addition to like fetishizing you or exoticizing you or whatever it may be, it's like. Oh well, like this is who you are, so you have to represent mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, and and I and I have also seen it from from the other side too with um, men of color or or Latino men uh, almost discrediting, being like, well, you're not enough. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. One hundred percent. I th I would say that's the majority mm -hmm. of experiences. Mm -hmm. Is like you don't have X, Y, and Z. You don't have these skills. You don't have this history. You don't have this knowledge. So like. You're like yeah. just as good as the next white person. Yeah, yep. that's yeah. what it feels oh, like. Oh, yep. That, that, sucks. that, 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 sucks. that. that sucks. Yeah, it sucks. Mm. Oh. I've actually noticed that black men have specifically um, really made my skin color a topic of conversation. And mm. that, like, I've straight up had one guy that I was talking to. He's like, I love Latinas. And then I stopped talking to him after that. Sorry. Because <laughs> um, I was like, no. It's just, there are so many layers that I did not want to unpack with him. I was like, I don't know you. Like, you're just not, mm -hmm. this is not going to happen. 
Yeah. And it's just the how like lighter skinned women of color are seen as like more beautiful mm -hmm. than darker skinned women and I don't fuck with that. Mm -mm. And so I just like when that gets brought up, I'm just like, Oh, this is bad. Like you're you want me because this a beauty ideal that I don't subscribe mm -hmm. to. And it's I think that is what's really gross about relationship dynamics is that I have no idea what's going on in their head about my, about me. I think about that all the time. Ooh, I think about that all the time, banging with white men. Like, what are they thinking of me? What are they really thinking of me? Like, what do they see me as? Am I their partner or am I their sexy, yeah. brown, sexualized, yeah. hypersexualized, mm -hmm. um, promiscuous yeah. love interest right now? Like, what am I, what yeah. am I to you? Ooh. I've never really been with white men, but I, with white women, it's seen as like, I am just as woke as you. Mm. That's, that was something that came up. That mm. was interesting, a different dynamic. Um, when I've been with women, it's like they try to be extra, I'm knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the oppressions of our society. And mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, you don't have to like prove Proof. anything yeah. to me. Bye. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I don't know if anyone's experienced that with white folks. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, relationships. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think it's hard to, like, especially when it comes to interacting with other POC, because as much as, like, within myself, I, like, speak for myself, I know I have internalized oppression and, like, internalized racism that I'm trying to navigate. That also is something that someone else can be trying to navigate as well, but not wanting to be the object that they try to figure that out on. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. So, like, one is, like, just you figure that out yeah. on your own, yeah. you got it. Like, here's yeah. some books, like maybe do this reading. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then come back to me when you feel like you've got mm -hmm. it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I feel like that's the tricky part is because people act a certain way because they have all of this. We've all been socialized in the same ways, right? Yeah. Like we are just lucky in some capacity to be given the time and the space to learn and unlearn. Mm -hmm. um, and like, where have people not been given that yeah. is what I try to think about too, especially when it comes to like taking the time to explore my multiraciality, taking the time to navigate and unpack like my internalized depression and internalized racism that I feel. And how do I give grace while also protecting myself to other people? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. That was yeah. good. That was good, like, of information, mm -hmm. <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> um, so kind of just to wrap us up, maybe we could do a part two of this conversation because oh. I feel like there oh, needs so to be time. Oh, it's yeah. so big. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll put that for spring term. But um, mm. what's one thing that you love about your multiraciality? Oh, Ooh. don't ask me first. Someone else. <laughs> 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 no, I just like had my brain thing. Okay. So I'll let like, someone else go. I can I can go. Um, I think there's a few things. I uh, appreciate that I can connect with a lot of different people mm -hmm. on a lot of different things mm -hmm. because I have um, almost like I know a little bit about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I it's like code switching is just a term mm -hmm. that we, we use a lot, but um, it, it, I think it's more than that. I think that it's also like a, um, a point of connection where mm -hmm. I can find community, which is where I found the most value in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. I was just gonna say like my ability to like transgress certain racial communities, mm -hmm. ones that are accepting, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so like I can dibble dabble here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that. Um, I like being able to relate to a lot of people um, who might not share the same exact mixed identity as me, but like, we still have like a sort of love, trust, and like responsibility yeah. and loyalty towards each other that yeah. you can't, f that I'm, I haven't been able to find with people who aren't multiracial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is. There's like this, like when you see another mixed person, they're like, I think you're mixed, I know you're mixed, but like we're yeah. gonna make eye contact yeah. from across the room. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was like, I, yes, I yeah. always do that. And it's just like that immediate <laughs> trust yeah. that I, I have with other yeah. multiracial people. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I love. Yeah. Yes, you don't have to justify. You can just be yeah. like, you're brown, you're also something else, and we are friends about yeah. it, and I love yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I think like my favorite part of my multiraciality is 
being in spaces like multiracial Aikido, which is a retreat mm. on campus, um, because in that space, we were just able to talk about the different issues that we were facing without saying what we were. Yeah. And it was like, people got to really talk about themselves in ways that they've never been able to mm-hmm. do so. Yeah. And so I think it's, for me, it's like the community. Even though we're mm-hmm. very, not very few of us, but like we're not always together, but like knowing that there's another multiracial person that I work with is really helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like the people that I know, I think is what I love about myself, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Like it's the people around me that makes me love myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think for me, what's coming up is like the uniqueness of experience. Mm -hmm. Like I have the opportunity to navigate space and move through the world in such a unique way. And I have food that's a part Mm -hmm. of me that like Mm -hmm. I'm so fucked up about because I love food and like it's so damn good. (laughs) And like I get to eat my mom's like native Hawaiian food and I get to eat my dad's black food and we like get to mix this all together in a beautiful way that like some people will never have and I'm like damn that sucks for you but like I'm over here eating and like getting fat and like having a good time because this food is so good and that also comes with the community and like Mm -hmm. the people that I get to share space with um that I love so much and I feel so grateful for Mm, that was really well said well Thank you so much for coming on oh, and like, having yeah. this conversation. Yeah. It honestly yeah. made my day a little bit better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with that, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back soon with more people on our yes. show, which I'm really excited about. And we have some upcoming events, so stay tuned and follow us on Instagram. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.